I was putting the uh, message together, I got a little nostalgic. Y'all remember the good old days? Raise your hand if you remember the good old days. And you might be looking at me thinking, what do you know about the good old days? Listen, I had good old days. I had good old days too. The 90s, whew, they were awesome. No. Uh, <laughs> Goodness, no, I, 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 and as, as I've had children, I, I, I get kind of confronted with this because in the good old days, you got to go out and play, right? You went out and played, and, you, and it was the expectation to go out and run, go, go do things, and come back when? When are you allowed to come back? When the street lights come on. Very good, everyone. Excellent. That's good. So that was a good standard that went on throughout, right? And then in the summertime, it kind of got extended, right? Thanks to daylight savings or whatever it is. You know, the, it still stayed light out past 8, 9 o'clock. And sometimes that was the best memories, running around with your friends out in the, in the cool of the night. I'm from Pennsylvania, so it wasn't that Florida sticky weather where I used to live, but that nice, cool air. I remember uh, going to my grandma's house, my grandma O'Shea, she had 14 grandchildren, uh, some of the older ones remember this, and we would, uh, she lived in a little neighborhood, and when we would all gather there for whatever family, whatever it was, we were there for all sorts of things, the older grandchildren would uh, go, and we would uh, go to a Turkey Hill, does anyone know what Turkey Hill is, raise your hand if you're doing it's a convenience store, okay? And it was just down the road, but road a piece from where my grandmother lived, and we would cut through yards to get to the Turkey Hill. We'd get there and we'd buy candy. We'd buy candy cigarettes. Does anyone remember candy cigarettes? Yeah? Yeah? Most, some of us went on to actually smoke cigarettes and maybe that was why. But, but anyway, so we would do those things. It was what, such a cherished memory. But I hear my mom's voice come over the den and she says, now listen, I don't want you cutting through yards. And I'm like, why mom? Everywhere, my cousins are doing, that's how you get there quick. And she says, you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to be troubled by association. If something happens in someone's yard and they see a group of kids walking by, you're going to get in trouble even though you didn't do anything. And that piece of advice then grew as I got older to be careful who you are associate with and your friends. And if your friends do something that you know you're not supposed to do, have the courage to walk away or call me or your dad and we will come get you. Now, I omit it here because sometimes parents say to their kids, we'll come get you, no questions asked, right? No, not my mom. She would ask all sorts of questions. There would, be, there would be a pickup and there would be a third degree. So I can't give her that blessing. But she would pick me up and she said, have the courage to do that. Now, fast forward to one of my own children. I'm not going to say which one it is. You can use your imagination because I don't want to embarrass. This, this child got in trouble at the YMCA the other day. He didn't want to go back because he was, he was putting time out, sort of, so to speak. Oh, he, ah! <laughs> I'm sorry, Caleb. I tried. And I said, we asked him why. Why did you get in trouble? Well, he was running when he wasn't supposed to. And they told him to stop. And my earnest little boy just wants to do what he wants to do and kept on going. So I asked him, I said, why didn't you listen, Caleb? And he said, well, my friends were running. And so I had to keep running to keep up with them. And all of the parental advice comes flooding back onto me. Isn't it funny? And you don't have to be a parent. You could work with children to do this. As you're working with a child and you see their logic, all of the advice that your parents had given you or grandparents or someone that you trust comes flooding back. It takes courage to do the right thing. Can we all agree? It takes courage to do the right thing. Often we fight this internal war that tempts us to do the wrong thing. And Paul rightly describes this in Romans of wanting really to do both when we're Christians. There's a part of us that wants to do good and, and can't. And the reason why we can't is because there's also a part of us that generally wants to do bad. It's a desire on both ends. Now Paul is in front of Jerusalem. And he says a very profound thing in front of Jerusalem that demonstrates this internal war, this ongoing defense, but that he is assured that he is faithfully following his call, doing the right thing, assured of his obedience, doing the right thing, and walking in step with Christ. He said he has lived his life before God in good conscience. So today, as we go, and you see the main point up there, it takes courage and being of good conscience. We're going to go back to Jerusalem where Paul is currently in a defense, currently on trial, and we get some more lessons from him. And ultimately, as it's centered on this, the two lessons that we're going to discuss here today 
is that it takes, um, go to the, the two lessons one. There you go. One more. There you go. That there are, that when you share the gospel, it is not always heard. It takes courage to have good conscience because sharing the gospel is not always heard by people. And that being all in requires Jesus to stand by us. Being of good conscience before God and by God, it means aligning your whole life's rhythms to the beat of Christ, living out the truth of his salvation, faithfully following and obeying his call for you. We want to live so that one day we hear from the Lord when we see him face to face, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. So, let's get to it. What, where is Paul at in this, and, and where are we at? So, we're going to open up to Acts chapter 22, and we're going to pick up. So, this is verse 22 through uh, chapter 23, verse 11. Last week, if you remember, Paul now gets in front of, uh, of a mob of sorts. He's been arrested and, and, and bound by Roman authorities. He appeals to whoever that is that, that has him, I would like to speak to this mob, and they allow him to do it. And I think I have to go back and look. I think he kind of lets the cat out of the bag that he's, that he's a Roman citizen at that point. But anyways, they, they give him the opportunity to speak in front of this mob. That's a mob of Jewish, his Jewish kinsmen, brothers and sisters, right? And as he speaks in front of them, he gives this defense of, of who he is and that he realizes that his identity as a Jewish person is most realized in knowing who Christ is. The hope of Israel, the hope of, uh, of their salvation, the hope of all salvation. And you see that the crowd is kind of tracking along. In fact, verse 22 says, up until that point, the crowd was listening to him. And then he drops the bomb about how Christ has called him to minister to, to preach to, and to bring in these outside nations, the Gentiles. And at that, craziness. So let's look at this. Acts 22, verse 22 and following. Now, as I said, up to this word, they listened to him. They raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. They want him dead. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and dipping up dust off the air as they do, the tribune ordered him, that's the Romans, ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he needs to be examined by flogging. So now this is the thing in the, in the, in the time period here. And this actually, some commentators say that this uh, Roman tribune, whomever, the guy's in charge, is actually giving a gift to Paul of, of, of due process. That this is something that you, instead of killing him outright, will torture him through flogging. Flogging as Christ was, was, was with the cat and nine tails, you know, the leather and the bones and rips your back. Basically, they spread them out. They rip their back open until they confess or not confess. So this Roman guy is thinking he's doing Paul a favor by giving him a chance to confess before killing him by flogging, to find out, yeah, I know, right? Don't you want to live back then, the good old days? Uh, examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting, why these folks, this mom was shouting against Paul like this. Verse 25, but when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Now, Roman law would say no. Being that Paul is a Roman citizen, he is afforded to not be bound up. He is afforded a trial. He's afforded all of those things. When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, Whoa, what are you going to do? What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. Now, you would think, then wouldn't everybody just say, Hey, I'm a Roman citizen. Please stop, right? Though they actually had an or a system of organization back there. Paul actually may have had something on his person that he could show that he was a Roman citizen. But also, if they found out that he wasn't, he dies immediately. So they don't take any of that kind of stuff lightly. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul said, yes. And the tribune answered, well, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. But Paul interrupts and says, yeah, but I'm a citizen by birth. Meaning that Paul was born into Roman citizenship, which means somewhere in his line, someone did amazing things for the Roman government that afforded his family to be 
a citizen of Rome, even though he's also ethnically Jewish. So for those who were about to examine him, they withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was this Roman citizen, and he had bound him. It's unlawful to bind him up. But the next day, desiring to know the real reason why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council, this is the Sanhedrin, have them come. Now, Sanhedrin, same people who crucified Christ, they're the muckety mucks, right? They bring them in because he wants to figure out what's going on. And looking intently at the council, Paul says this. So now this is what's happening. Paul has had one opportunity to speak to a mob of Jewish people, and now he's having the opportunity to give a defense to the Makedimuks, to the people who have power in the Jewish faith. He looks at them intently. He uses this term of endearment, brothers. I have lived my life before God in all good conscience. Underline that. That is a fantastic verse. I have lived my life before God in all conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? Yet contrary to the law, you order me struck. Now those that stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? Also custom in the Jewish faith is you don't speak bad about the high priest. So... We're going to adopt that now. So as a new rule for Bethel, <laughs> can't speak bad about me. No. Anyway, so no, this is a, a rule. And this is what, there's a little bit of a, a debate here of, of, of Paul's tone. So Paul says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Some may say this is being sarcastic, as in to say, he's not acting like a high priest, so how was I supposed to know? Since, since he's not acting like a high priest, I can surely say what I want to say. Or it could be a true act of like, oh, oops, I, I overstepped. Paul's about to be flogged by a big whip with, with nails and things in it. So you can imagine his mental state might be a little shaky here back and forth. Either way, there's this, okay, got it. I won't speak evil of, of the ruler. Now, when Paul perceived that one part of this group were Sadducees, They were sad, you see, get it? Sadducees and the other were Pharisees. He cried out to the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Now, this is kind of a, basically, Paul takes a rhetorical grenade of sorts and throws it into the situation because the Pharisees and the Sadducees are not together on this. The Sadducees don't believe, and this is what it goes on to say, they don't believe in the resurrection believe in supernatural things like that. And so they're kind of like this own little sect within Jewish leadership. But the Pharisees buy into all of that. They buy into all that stuff about the resurrection and supernatural stuff. And so Paul, being a Pharisee, knows this, sees the opportunity and says, this is why I'm here, and drops that down. And then what happens? The Sadducees say that there was no resurrection, no angel, no spirit, but Pharisees acknowledge them all. Basically, verse 7, a dissension arises between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Verse 9, then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, The tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him back to the barracks. The following night, the Lord, that's Jesus, stood by him. Underline that. And he said, take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so now you must testify also in Rome. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Part two of Paul's defense. Another scene, if you will. And the discovery that we get out of here is that sharing the gospel is not always heard and received. Let's talk. So now you have this scene, this Jewish kinsman. They're rioting and they're out of control, both from the mob and now the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin should probably know better. These are men of distinction. To devolve so quickly into a violent dissension and clamor is mind-boggling, but maybe not so much. Because what humans like to do, even in religious circles, they like to hold on to a platform. They like to hold on to bits and pieces of truth that fit an agenda. And then they hold on to that and they 
stick their feet onto it, and if anything comes against it, they violently reject it. They, there's an upheaval of sorts. And you would say that the Pharisees are in line with Paul. It's just one little degree to get them to understand Jesus, but for some reason, they're blind to all of that. They buy into the resurrection. They have a hope for Israel to be reconciled with God, but they can't get there that it's Jesus like Paul has done. Why are there such visceral and violent reactions? Why do people do this? And this is par for the course for God's people, is it not? If you were to go into the Old Testament and read any of the prophecies, and most of the Old Testament is filled with books of prophecies. It is of God's people who are in exile, who have taken up idol worship, who have done everything that they can to be totally gone from God. And God sends prophets to them to kind of shine a light, to bring truth, to call them back. But these prophets, they were not received. They were ridiculed. They were not listened to. Hear the words from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 23 through 28. Listen to this. But this command I gave them, God says, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in a way that I commanded you, that I may be with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear. They walked in their own councils, their own platforms, and their own stubbornness of their evil hearts, and went backward, not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I've persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but they stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. So he says to Jeremiah, so you shall speak all of these words to them, but guess what? They will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer to you. And you shall say to them, this is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God and did not accept discipline. Truth has perished and has cut off from their lips. The same thing, my friends, has been said to Ezekiel and Isaiah. And these are all prophets that were called to go after the exiled Israel and Judah, to go after God's people. What about the Gentiles? You all know the prophet Daniel, right? And Daniel was in a Babylon captivity, and he had prophecies, and it was also rejected by outside nations as well. And why is that? I think because sometimes when you're confronted with the light and the truth, we often look at the person who's saying it and think, you're no better than me. You're no better than what I am. How, how, why do you think you have such divine excellence and superiority to tell me what I'm doing wrong? Jesus, John chapter 3, when talking with Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees? He comes at night, right? And he comes at night, and, and, and Jesus goes through this whole thing about how, you, how, how Nicodemus is going to come alive to the truth. And then ends it there in this, this passage of 19 through 21, talking about, about the light. And he says this, that this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light because the works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come into it, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true, whoever has good conscience before God, comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. It's not that we're better, it's we have a better way. The whole hallmark of Christian witness is our understanding as witnesses that by ourselves we are dirty, rotten skunks. That we are sinners just like everyone else in need of the salvation, in need of the light that comes from Jesus. It's not that we're better, it's just that there's a better way. When confronted with the truth, evil hates it, they reject it. The light shines on all the reasons that disqualifies them from being with God, and they have to face the truth of their disobedience and the distance that they have from God. So, of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they don't want to confront that. They are in positions of religious power. Why would they even want to entertain the idea that they could be wrong? Now, Paul is acquainted with all of this because as a Pharisee, he is well acquainted with prophets. We can stand on his education. He understands the hope of Israel is to one day to be reconciled with God. But he has done the work of connecting the dots to Jesus through the Holy Spirit 
And through his continual obedience of living of good conscience, he knows his ears and eyes have been opened. He has seen the blinding light. You remember his conversion? The light was so bright it blinded him. Just to say to him, you think you see, but you don't. You lean on me and trust in me, and I'll open your eyes. Isn't that great? Paul's hope and life of good conscience is to faithfully live that truth out and to follow his divine call, which is to preach and teach to Jews and Gentiles. And so far, the Gentile part is going great. People are responding. But any time that he goes to the temple and speaks to the Jews, he gets some, but it's usually met with some sort of riot, some sort of upheaval, and it's no different now. In front of this mob, back last week, they want to have him dead. Now in front of the leaders of the, of the, the Sanhedrin, they want him arrested and, and, and be gone. He's failing at that part. And I think that it really affects Paul. And why I think that is because in Romans chapter 9, don't flip there, just listen. Hear Paul's heart. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul's heart would rather he be cut off and go to hell if it means that he would save his Jewish brothers and sisters. It takes great courage to be of good conscience because sometimes sharing the gospel is not heard. It's not heard from just random strangers, but more deeply and more hurtful. Sometimes it's not heard from our loved ones, our friend, our children, our spouse. It's not heard. And so what do you do? Do you recoil? Do you just kind of give up? So I remember if I got too preachy with certain folks in my, my family, they would be like, okay, that's, thanks a lot, preacher man. You're good to go. Zip it. You know, they, they would have this reaction to it. Because I think there was this, this sense of guilt. Do you think you're better than me? I know who you truly are. I'm like, yeah. But I have seen the light and I know who Christ is and there's a better way for you. And so Paul continues. He continues to live of good conscience before God, not recoiling, but continuing to preach. Even though these were two failed, seemingly on the outside, failed events. Which brings me to the second truth and it's a callback of last week. Remember last week I said you have to be all in. That was the discovery. You got to be all in. Paul didn't shy away to tell the Jewish folks, I'm supposed to go to the Gentiles, knowing full well that this was going to have such a visceral reaction. But what we discover here this week is that being all in, the strength to have that, to be a part of who you are, requires Jesus to stand by us. Where does our help and our courage come from? It comes from the Lord. That comes right out of one of the Psalms in the Old Testament. Just as our call and purpose comes from Christ, the courage to faithfully walk in that call and follow him comes from Jesus. This seems like Sunday school logic. You all are probably like, yeah, this is not new news. I get it. But then I ask you, how often do we forget that our strength and our courage to get through trials and hardships come from Christ? How often do you find yourselves trying to manage the hardships and the chaos of life on your own? If you're like me, it trips me up every single time. How often do we think that we can do it and buy into that lie? Now, the final scene of the passage, remember, he's been taken away by force. There's been another eruption No Jewish people, the Sanhedrin, no one's professing Jesus at the moment. And now he's back in possibly some sort of captivity. But who comes by him? The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage. Now, other translations have here, says, be of good cheer. I don't like that. 
That sounds so very Pollyanna, right? That sounds so very like, Jesus like, you've been tortured, you almost got flogged, you've been beaten, be of good cheer, man. It's all right, go, right? No, take courage. And there's a, there's a continuous connotation here in, that, in the Greek. It means continue to keep up this courage. And obviously not on your own. It says the Lord stood by him. When was the last time we saw the ascended Jesus stand? Do you remember? Stoning of Stephen. Once again, Luke is establishing Paul's prophetic office. And calling, God is calling Paul to step into where Stephen was cut off. He stands by Paul and gives him this power, gives him this strength to say, you got to keep on keeping on. You are not going to die here, Paul. You are not going to die in Jerusalem. I still have more for you to do. Go to Rome now. Go to Rome and do this very same thing. And I got to believe that I think Paul was empowered and encouraged by this because we kind of know the rest of the story, right? That Paul eventually does get to, get to Rome and, and do all those things. But, but I think he's encouraged here by this, to have the chance to continue to follow in this call. Christ and the real hope of Israel has come. The Pharisees can't see it, but Paul has connected the dots and he continues to not shy away, to have the Jesus, the Christ, stand beside him and give him courage. It takes courage to be of good conscience. And that courage comes from Christ who stands by, before, among us, and as we faithfully follow his call, even when people reject us. How great, my friends, is the grace of our God that even when we are the most stiff-necked people, I mean, the Sanhedrin were the ones who sentenced Jesus to be crucified, and yet Christ sends Paul to them. Here's another chance to respond, my brothers. Here's another chance to hear it and be fully redeemed. How great is that? How great is it when Pastor Jennifer read the list of people who did this for us, of the people that come into our lives when we are most lost to say there's a better way? If God can have the courage to forgive such grievances and forgive such people like me and you, can we faithfully step into this call, his call for us to boldly and courageously share our love with others, even if we get rejected, even if they don't hear us? even if it may lead to our arrest. Can we do that? It takes courage to be of good conscience, to do the right thing when our bodies want us to do wrong, to speak up when the world wants us to be quiet, and to love and serve the Lord faithfully, knowing that he's standing beside us and to not forget that. Can we do that? It takes courage to be of good conscience. And that power doesn't come just from listening to this sermon, but comes from the Lord Jesus who stands by you. One of the best ways that we can be encouraged is by doing what we're about to do next, is to come to the Lord's table and to partake in his, in his supper. What we believe as Presbyterians is that when we partake in the Lord's supper, we are standing with Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is with us and reminding us and empowering us of the truth of the grace that we have received. Don't just take this communion, these elements, and think this is just what we do. We drink the juice and take the bread. But truly remember the sacrifice and the lengths that Christ went to save you and I. And be empowered and strengthened by that grace when you partake in this feast. If you are a faithful follower of Christ and profess him to be your Lord and Savior, you promise to follow him to the end, to serve him to the end. And as that song reminded us, give us the grace, O Lord. That's that courage to be of good conscience to serve him to the end. There's no retirement in the house of the Lord, right? All of us are uniquely gifted at every age and stage in life to boldly witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. May you do that this week with all the courage, with all the faith, and with all the strength from our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen. Have a great weekend, everybody.